This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Big deal. Greece and its Eurozone creditors agree on a four-month extension of that country's bailout. And that sends the Dow and S&P 500 to all-time closing highs. Tech talk. As the Nasdaq takes one step closer to 5,000, our market monitor has a list of technology stocks to put on your buy list. And the hunt for yield. Companies are hiking dividends like mad this year. Why? And Fortox stocks to consider if you want income now. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Friday, February 20th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Tyler Matheson. Sue Herrera has the evening off. Well, what a finish to the week for stocks. The Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P 500 close at records, and the Nasdaq is now within two percentage points of one. Why? Well, simple today, because Greece, after weeks of posturing and brinksmanship on both sides, reached a temporary debt deal with its Eurozone creditors, and that is where we begin tonight. Now, those creditors will extend Greece's loan agreement for four months. That's less than the six months Greece had asked for, but Greece still has lots of work to do. By Monday, the indebted country has to submit details of the financial measures it plans to take. The agreement came down to the wire. Its rescue deal was set to expire at the end of the month, at which point it would soon have run out of money. Michelle Caruso Cabrera has more on the agreement. She's been following the story for weeks, and it is really the agreement that investors have been waiting for. What's in it? How good a deal is it for both sides? So they finally got a deal, but it was only after the Greek government caved in on nearly all of their demands. They said they would never be monitored by their European partners in a program. Guess what? They're going to be monitored by their European partners <laughs> in a program. Despite all that, the Greek finance minister tried to put a very positive spin on it today. We are leaving behind the days when a list of reforms that Greek society treated as a foreign body was imposed but not implemented because it was a foreign body. As of today, we're beginning to be co-authors of our destiny, co-authors of the reforms that we want to implement, which we are going to dictate, which we will discuss with our partners. Those list of reforms, as Tyler said, have to be submitted by Monday. Here's the key question. The reforms that this government has wanted to do, they're socialist reforms. They're not the reforms that the rest of Europe wanted. So that's the first test. That Will they like pass a, on that Monday? That sounded like a lot of brave talk, putting a face yes. for a domestic Greek audience on this deal. That's for sure what's going to happen. You're going to hear a lot said in Greece that's going to try to spin this into something very positive. But ultimately, they're going to have to stick to a lot of things that they didn't want to stick to. If they do, it's important. They will get 10 billion euros, roughly, that's sitting there that should have been theirs in the past if only they had stuck to previous reform commitments. 10 billion is a lot of money. Yes. But it, it, in the context of a whole country with 200 plus billion dollars yes. worth of debt, it's, it's a drop in the bucket. Is it enough? Probably not. There's already talk in Europe that once this program ends, they're probably going to have to come together and figure out if they're going to have to give Greece more money. Because the one thing Greece got today was a little bit of leniency on how much of a budget surplus they have to have. The reason they were told they had to have a huge budget surplus is because they have to pay back their debt. Mm -hmm. So if you tell them, okay, your budget surplus can be smaller, well, that means they're not paying back their debt. So somebody's going to have to fill that gap. Very quickly, are we going to be back here in four months? Yes, for sure. That's a short answer. Yes. Michelle, have a great weekend. <laughs> Michelle Caruso Cabrera. Well, stocks took off once the agreement between Greece and its creditors was announced. The deal reduces market uncertainty, and it eliminates for now the risk of Greece leaving the Eurozone. For now. By the close, the blue chip Dow index was up 154 points to finish at a new all-time closing high. It's first of 2015. That number, 18,140. The Nasdaq gained 31, its eighth consecutive session higher, and that is its highest level in 15 years. And the S&P 500 rose nearly 13 points, also an all-time closing high. For the week, all three major indexes up, the Nasdaq gaining nearly 1.5%. Well, after a bumpy start to the year, February has turned out to be a good month for stocks, a record setter, in fact, but not just for the major averages. A closer look at market data reveals that February is on track to be a record setting month for companies raising dividends. So far, 144 companies in the Russell 1000 have boosted dividends in the past 30 days. And here to explain why and to give us his favorite stocks for income right now is Charlie Bobrinskoy, 
Vice Chairman and Head of Investment Strategies at Ariel. Charlie, welcome back. Good to have you here. Why are so many companies raising dividends right now? Well, because people can't get yield anywhere else. With government bond interest rates at 2% and CDs at zero, people are trying to find yield somewhere. And so corporations are giving people what they want, which is yield. Are they also uh, acting perhaps, obviously their balance sheets are in better shape, they're making nice profits, uh, but also are some of them uh, trying to forestall the possibility that corporate uh, 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 activists would come in and say, hey, you need to return more capital to investors. If you give them a dividend now, you can't accuse them of not returning capital. Yeah, that's a common refrain of activists. You're absolutely right that people have to, been too conservative with the shareholders' money. When you own stock in a company, that cash that they're building is your money. And a lot of activists think that the managements have been hoarding that money, sometimes making poor acquisitions with that money. So, right, so that's so, a common playbook. So let's move to some of the uh, areas that, that you think are really good uh, in income plays uh, for equity investors. And I want to start with a couple of your stocks. One of them is IBM. Right. So IBM, if you noticed, uh, Warren Buffett just filed what he'd been buying, and he bought a lot more IBM. IBM hasn't been growing at the rate that we would like, but it now has a very attractive dividend yield. They're in the forefront of big data with their Watson computers, uh, so that we think they're very well positioned. The stock is extremely cheap at less than 11 times earnings, a great value investment that is paying a very high dividend. But let's talk a little bit about that. Sometimes the divid the yield goes up because the stock price is coming down. And that's what's been that's happening right. uh, to, to IBM. So is that's there what a people call an accidental high yielder. That's right. That's right. And so what happens then is that your 2% yield or 3 or whatever it is, it becomes a 3 or 4% yield, is wiped out by the loss in capital. How do I, how do I choose wisely to avoid those? Well, you try to uh, buy stocks that aren't going to go down by 20%. But Look, uh, IBM's been a wonderful stock for the last 10 years. It, it was at 70 um, seven years ago, and it went all the way to 200. It did very well. It has clearly hit a bit of a bump, mm -hmm. as they did not make the earnings expectations that management had indicated. Management thought they'd be making $20 a share next year. Mm -hmm. They're going to make more like 17. So it clearly mm -hmm. has hit a bump. The stocks come down, making the dividend yield go up. Right now, it's trading at about 11 times earnings. Even if it wasn't paying a great dividend, right. we would be recommending the stock. And Mr. Buffett's right there with you, Charlie. Let's uh, get some Absolutely. quick thoughts on, on three of your other dividend picks right now, Stanley Black & Decker, Western Union, and Lockheed. So Stanley Black & Decker is a play, an investment in the housing industry, which is still stubbornly about a million homes um, a year. We should be at 1.5 million. That's the historic rate that we've been at for 30 or 40 years, and we haven't gotten back to that rate yet. But we're now at a point where buying a home is more attractive than mm -hmm. renting. And so Stanley, which makes a lot of tools, tool sales go up. They sell to individual homeowners and to construction workers. So we think Stanley, which stock is still relatively cheap, is going to do very well, and it has a great dividend yield. And Western Union, of course, people think, oh, it's a, it's a telegraph company. It's not that. It's a payments company. It's a payments company, a cross-border payments company. Mm -hmm. And the people who are sending money back home to their relatives in Mexico or people going to Russia and sending money back to the Philippines, there is uh, more traffic, uh, cash going across borders really than at any other time. That's a growth business. And Western Union stock has been recovering. It's had a very nice run here, but it still now has a, has a very attractive dividend yield at about 3%. And quickly on Lockheed. Lockheed is building the F-35 fighter jet that all the major branches of the armed services are going to use. It really is a very easy to predict their profits over the next five or six years. Again, trading at a very reasonable price. We'd be recommending it mm -hmm. without the great dividend yield, but it has a spectacular right. dividend yield for people so that are looking IBM, for it. So IBM, Stanley Black & Decker, Western Union and Lockheed, Charlie Bobrinskoy with Ariel. Thanks very much. Well, Thanks oil prices, you bet, oil prices finished the day lower. Third straight losing session, crude supplies continuing to mount. Rig counts also declined this week, making it 11 straight weeks of decreases on that number. Uh, West Texas crude uh, off 82 cents to $50.34. Brent, though, up a penny at 60.22. But it was natural gas prices that saw a big jump today, up 4% on below normal temperatures. How about below zero temperatures in uh, much of the eastern part of the country?
Well, as of this evening, there is still no agreement between dock workers uh, and the shippers out west on those West Coast ports, despite an earlier report to the contrary today. Labor Secretary Tom Perez reportedly gave both sides a deadline of today to end the month-long labor dispute or take the discussions back to Washington, go back to the principal's office. But as Jane Wells reports, deal or no deal, things won't get back to normal anytime soon. Talks did continue today, but there was no deal, as far as we know, despite the presence all week in negotiations of Labor Secretary Tom Perez. And it's come to this. BB&T Capital Markets claims KFC is flying chicken wings to China, flying them. And automakers are paying up to $600,000 to charter 747s to bring in auto parts from Asia to here. Fuji Heavy Industries is paying an additional $60 million a month for air freight, again, according to BB&T. But Bed Bath & Beyond now joining a growing line of retailers saying sales may take a hit because the slowdown has caused a shortage at warehouses and stores. Another company taking a hit, Mastercraft Furniture up in Oregon. It manufactures upholstered furniture for IKEA, has seen delays in raw materials, and that is a problem which will continue to ripple through the business no matter when a deal is reached. We lost business starting right in January. We uh, ran out of raw materials and Mastercraft had to lay 180 people off uh, for two and a half weeks in January. The fact is that we are working probably three days a week, uh, which has uh, put a real crimp in the paycheck. You know, we, live, work, we work paycheck to paycheck. If no deal by the end of business Friday, the Labor Secretary has reportedly told both sides they must come to Washington to continue talks next week. It's not clear why they can't talk through the weekend, though, also, an important element we do not know yet. Will employers, the Pacific Maritime Association, stop all work loading and unloading ships for another weekend because it costs extra to do so, and they say there's no point? That decision, as far as we know, has not yet been made. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jane Wells in Los Angeles. Still ahead, ever wonder how suspicious trades are detected? We will take you inside the NASDAQ's secret surveillance room where no reporter has been before until now. government will grant an extension to sign up for a health plan under the Affordable Care Act less than a week after the original enrollment deadline passed. Up to six million Americans are expected to face a penalty for not having health insurance this year. This extension, which runs until April 30th, gives those people more time to buy insurance and avoid that penalty. Officials also said that IRS forms sent to about 800,000 tax filers contained health insurance subsidy errors. Well, federal regulators will begin to fine Japanese airbag maker Takata $14,000 a day for failing to fully cooperate with an investigation into its faulty airbag inflators. Takata has been slow to respond to government demands for information on the airbags, which can explode with too much force and send shrapnel flying into drivers and passengers. The Nasdaq's secret surveillance room, it's where fraudulent trading activity is detected. No reporter has been given access to the room until now. Eamon Javers went inside to see how fraud is detected and what happens once it is. The NASDAQ has never allowed cameras into its secure market watch fraud surveillance facility before, but they opened their doors to us exclusively today to see just how they patrol the exchange for suspicious trading. NASDAQ says they process 4 billion messages each day at this Maryland facility using computer algorithms that analyze 35,000 parameters in real time, sending alerts to human analysts for review within two seconds of the unusual trades. They're also monitoring Twitter and real-time news events and then running back the trading ahead of announcements to watch for patterns of insider trading. And they say they conduct background searches into the personal histories of executives of public companies looking for people with histories of fraud or impropriety. We're looking for abnormal behavior, something that might indicate insider trading, something that might indicate manipulation of the market. We investigate that and if we feel it needs to be further investigated, we refer it to FINRA or to the SEC for further work. 
Last year, NASDAQ says they spotted 766 incidents that were so serious they forwarded them to federal regulators for further investigation. And they say that over the past three years, 112 cases resulted in fines and penalties. And many of those began right here in this room. For now, they say they can only see some trading that happens on the other exchanges globally. But technology, they say, is right around the corner that will give them access to trades in many more parts of the financial system. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eamon Jabbers in Rockville, Maryland. Well, farmers are buying less equipment, and that is weighing on John Deere, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. The tractor maker lowered its sales outlook, predicting that the stronger dollar will hurt sales, already suffering from a slump in machine demand. This as declines in crop prices and cuts in tax incentives make farmers less inclined to buy new gear. Now, despite the warning, results did top estimates, and that's one reason why shares were up a fraction to 92.43 on this up day. Ann Incorporated, the parent of Ann Taylor, reportedly working with J.P. Morgan on a possible sale. This comes after Ann said in a regulatory filing last October that it was reviewing its strategic options. Shares popped almost 5% to $36.76. Capital Oil and Gas slashed its capital budget, cut back its production plans for the year amid those tumbling energy prices. The company also swung to a loss in the fourth quarter. Still, the stock was up more than 1% to $28.06 today. Rough day for shares of rocket fuel. The digital ad company's loss widened sharply in the fourth quarter as costs surged. That offset higher revenues. Shares plunged almost 27%. $10.82. Well, call it the new industrial revolution. Billions of dollars being spent now on making big machines like wind turbines and oil and gas systems smarter and more efficient. And the potential for change is huge, not just for manufacturers, but for the way we work and live. Morgan Brennan has more. So I go like this to pull up a menu. It's called the Industrial Internet of Things, or here at General Electric Software Center, simply the Industrial Internet. It's about helping operators do what they do already in a better way. The concept, making big machines smarter through the adoption of software and big data analytics. In the energy space, it's quite clear. If I can get to total efficiency, I mean, there's just so much upside in what they, what they have that, uh, you know, small gains are big numbers. Take this wind turbine. It's equipped with sensors connected to software that uses real-time and historic data to generate 5 to 10 percent more power, which in turn, for a wind farm, can boost profitability by 20 percent. GE has developed an operating system called Predix that hosts dozens of applications catering to a spectrum of industries. There's an app that tracks oil and gas pipelines to prevent possible leaks and projects that harness augmented reality to make factory inspections easier and faster. All of it with the potential to save businesses billions of dollars in downtime. If you think about the Internet of Things, there are about 50 billion things that are going to come online in the next coming years. And all of those assets, all of those machines, people interact with them in some way. And so uh, it's going to be enormous. Right now, the Industrial Internet of Things is still in infant stages. But Accenture notes it could reach $500 billion by 2020, with a larger global economic impact in the trillions of dollars by 2030. Analysts say the possibilities will be endless, and not just for GE. In a way, it's, you know, they, they see the Internet of Things as the way to save their businesses from commoditization and competition. A growing list of companies are getting involved. GE has partnerships with AT&T, Verizon, SoftBank, Cisco, and Intel, to name a few. But other industrial heavyweights, including Rockwell Automation, Emerson, and Honeywell, have been dedicating resources as well. Still, there are risks. Cybersecurity remains a primary issue. Also, the not yet known effects that automation could have on the labor market. And for companies like GE, the challenge of monetization. So this new technology doesn't just become another cost of doing business in the Internet age. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan in San Ramon, California. Well, as the NASDAQ approaches 5,000, our market monitor tonight says some of the biggest names in technology are attractive right now. He's Jordan Posner, Senior Portfolio Manager with Matrix Asset Advisors. Jordan, welcome. Good to have you with us. Uh, you are a value player, and people don't typically think of technology stocks as value plays, uh, but you go bottoms up. You look at individual companies, uh, their balance sheets, their uh, income statements, uh, and their stock prices, and you found some in technology, beginning with Symantec. Why is it a value play? We like Symantec. They are, have a good, solid business in two areas, IT security. 
uh, and also data storage. Both of those businesses have very positive fundamental growth still attached to them. The companies decided that they can actually generate some value by breaking the two businesses into two separate companies. We think that will actually unlock some value. The company has actually been improving its operating performance, uh, and that is continuing to improve going forward. Uh, stock is relatively inexpensive at around 13 times next year's earnings. Uh, pays a nice uh, dividend yield of about 2.3 percent. Mm -hmm. And uh, we think that stock's probably worth closer to $30 than the current trading price uh, in the mid-20s. And also, uh, because you mentioned they're going to uh, split the company into two parts, uh, it, it uh, coincides with one of your other themes, which is sort of the, the appeal of internal restructurings, absent an outsider, but if you do it inside, it, it can achieve the same goals. Second choice is Microsoft. Now, Microsoft's been under some external pressure from some uh, uh, external shareholders, but also uh, with the big management change that took place there a year ago, uh, Satya Nadella has really made a lot of improvement there. Um, everybody knows what Microsoft is, but people don't really realize that the enterprise business, which is continuing to be very, very strong, uh, is really the crux of the business. And Microsoft is actually leading a lot of the move uh, to the cloud, again, on a valuation basis. Uh, the stock is cheap, around 14 and a half times uh, next year's earnings, uh, pays a nice dividend. Uh, we think the stock is dramatically undervalued because of a pause that happened uh, in the December quarter earnings. We think that will resume, uh, and we think the stock is actually better valued probably at around $53 a share. All right, let's move on to number three, which would be Qualcomm, a dominant uh, uh, chip for mobile uh, devices, which is really the space everybody wants to be in. But over the past year, the stock is down. Why do you like it now? Well, uh, we've liked it for a while. Qualcomm's had some issues uh, most recently with a Chinese antitrust investigation that they settled at a lower cost than uh, was expected by the market, well within their ability uh, to pay. Uh, the company throws off tremendous amount of cash, is dominant, and will remain dominant in a very strong growth industry. Uh, the company uh, has, on its balance sheet today, $19 a share in cash, which is more than a quarter of the stock's value. Uh, throws off a dividend of about 2.4%. Uh, uh, trades, if you adjust for the cash, at only 10 times uh, this year's earnings, we think the stock should uh, trade above $90. All right, Jordan, thank you very much. Great uh, analysis of three very interesting companies. Jordan Posner with Matrix Asset Advisors. And coming up, the big money behind Hollywood's biggest night. The big business of Hollywood will be on display at this Sunday's Academy Awards. Uh, but behind all the glitz and glamour, there's real money at stake. Julia Borston takes a look at what an Oscar is really worth and whether the race for that coveted statue is actually a losing business. With Best Picture frontrunners Boyhood and Birdman grossing just $25 million and $37 million respectively, this year's top award could have a massive impact. You're rushing. Here we go. The smaller the box office performance of a nominated film, the bigger its boost from Oscar attention. Best Picture winners gross nearly $14 million more at the box office after winning than fellow nominees. That's according to an IBIS World study of winners from 2009 to 2013. But even the losers cash in. Oscar-nominated films remain in theaters on average about twice as long. And Oscar attention can boost home rentals as well. I think the immediacy of the online component will give the, some of these films that are now available on demand a bump literally on Oscar night. This year's nominees are the lowest grossing group since the Academy expanded the number of films that could be nominated for Best Picture to 10 back in 2009, an effort to include more box office hits and draw more viewers to the telecast. I got a military age male. With just one film that's been a really big hit, American Sniper, this year's Oscar telecast may suffer lower ratings than last year when four films topped $100 million at the U.S. box office. A lot of people are saying, well, why aren't there more blockbusters in the mix 
for Best Picture, and I would argue, you know, it's not the box office awards. It's supposed to be what are the best movies in that particular year. Did I do something to disrespect you? Not yet. And two of what the Academy thinks are the best movies, Birdman and Grand Budapest Hotel, were produced by Fox Searchlight, which has a total of 20 nominations, more than any other studio, making it the best position to cash in. The film with the least to gain from an Oscar win, Warner Brothers' American Sniper. It's grossed over $300 million in the U.S., so an Oscar win is unlikely to make much difference. Though studios spend millions of dollars to campaign for the prestige of an Oscar win, the investment doesn't always pay off. Rather than a statuette, many studios would rather have the box office success of American Sniper or of the blockbusters that never make it to the red carpet. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. And finally tonight, whether an actor takes home gold or not, they will still feel like a winner with all the free swag they'll get after this Sunday's Academy Awards. All the best and supporting actor and actress nominees and the best director nominees will get a gift bag worth about, get this, $160,000, double what they were valued at last year. And the giveaways will make you green with envy. Some of the freebies include three nights at a Tuscan villa, a $20,000 psychic reading, and an LED liposuction light. It is Hollywood, after all. And that is Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great evening and weekend, everybody. We'll see you Monday. Sue will be back then.